Well, God bless you. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Pastor Ronna May, and Jerry Palladino and I are here with you with Beyond Compare Ministries. And today we're going to take a little trip up to above the Arctic Circle. Actually, we're going to be about uh, 500 kilometers or 300 miles north of the Arctic Circle. It's way up there, and is it cold? But the hearts of the people are so wonderful. That picture that was just up, the, the thumbnail that had the promo for this week, it was a picture that I really enjoyed. Part of my bucket list was to always wanting to walk on water. I figured if Jesus walked on water, they tried to walk on water, others. But, you know, I thought, well, God, he said we could do whatever he does and even greater things. So I wanted to walk on water. I guess I just wasn't specific enough because I'm walking on water. The only problem is it's frozen solid. That's the Arctic Ocean. And those out in the background, you can see little um, boats. Those are frozen solid and they will be there till the spring thaw. Until then, they cannot move. But that was what part of my desire. But I got up there to the frozen weather, absolutely frozen. When I got off the plane, I thought I would never feel my nose again. But when you walk and you see all these wonderful people like this next picture, there's people up there from the littlest to the most youngest to the elderly, and they look so inviting. You see the mothers, the one mother, one grandmother carrying the babies on their back. And the little girl all dressed up in her parka. And that's how they keep warm up there. The polar bear, of course, <laughs> he keeps himself warm. And he's not inviting, but common. Actually, I, there was one out on the streets when I was up in Rankin Inlet, speaking up in Rankin Inlet. And they had to pick me up to take me to the meeting hall because with the polar bear out there, I didn't really want to walk. But anyways... It's a world in itself up there. You can't even drive into these communities. Cambridge Bay is part of an island, but you can't even drive to get to any of the places up in that up in that territory called Nunavut. It's all tundra, land that is frozen, and only the very surface even unthaws. The rest of it is frozen solid tundra, but you cannot drive on it. But anyhow. This is a song that I've asked if Jerry would do. We did it way back at the beginning of this series, but it's one that I love, and it's talking about, called You Can Change the World. And going up to that Arctic, my world was probably changed as much as, if not more, than theirs. I fell in love with the people up there. So, Jerry, could you go ahead with Change the World? You can't change the stormy weather You can't change the sands of time You can't change the rugged mountain So it's easier to climb But you can change somebody's life Just by giving them your own One by one will change the world so come on, sing this song You can change yourself It might take a little while You can change your friends Just by giving them a smile You can change the world And we've got so little time To chase away the darkness And fill the world with light You can't stop the rain from falling You can't stop the ocean's tide You can't stop the sun from shining Even if you try You can change yourself But you can stop that empty feeling You can change the world Of being all alone Just put love in someone's life You'll find love is in your own 
Yes, you can change yourself, it might take a little while You can change your friends just by giving them a smile You can change the world and we've got so little time To chase away the darkness and fill the world with light Yes, you can change yourself, it might take a little while You can change your friends just by giving them a smile You can change the world and we've got so little time To chase away the darkness and fill the world with light Yes, we can change the world and we've got so little time To chase away the darkness and fill the world with light You can change the world. That is for sure. And as that song says, you know, just a little smile. And a lot of times that's all it takes to make the difference in someone's day. That little smile that shows that they're cared for, that they're loved. But, you know, when I first started going up to the Arctic, my first trip up there, it was absolutely incredible. I'd been doing some meetings in a place a little further south, still pretty north, called Yellowknife. And um, there'd been a minor accident that split my toe wide open. So I had to go and have it operated on. And I was supposed to be flying up to Cambridge Bay to the extreme Arctic the next morning. Now, I couldn't get a shoe on that foot if I'd tried. And I, all I could put on was a sock. And I couldn't put any pressure on the foot, so I had to walk with crutches. Walking with crutches is a challenge to start with, but try doing it on ice and snow. It was so funny. When, when I got off the plane, it's like somebody had to be on each side of me with one foot holding the crutch in place so it didn't go sliding out from underneath me. But anyways, we headed on up, and the first place the plane landed was in a little town called Kugluktuk. Kugluktuk, an airport. And we've got a picture right there of that airport, Jerry. <laughs> you can see it's on solid ice and snow that that plane landed. And getting from the plane into the airport, walking on that solid ice and snow was not an easy task. But I made it. But when I got off that plane, in the next place we headed up to, we left there and we headed up to the place we were aiming for, Cambridge Bay, which is on a place called Victoria Island, way up north. And one of the women that was in charge of Arctic missions, Lynn Patterson, the younger of the two, she was with me on that flight. And we were talking on the flight and heading up there. And I really felt strongly, you know, in my spirit that there was something going on and that there was somebody that was down in that ice and snow and that there was somebody that was very concerned about them and worried about them, but they had literally died in that ice and snow. But it was, God said it was a very peaceful, nothing painful, very peaceful time that they, they left the earth. And so we carry on, and then we're heading up to Cambridge Bay now. And literally the land of ice and snow. There was no trees anywhere. We left the trees like 400 miles to the south. No trees anywhere near. You couldn't see a tree in sight. And the view from the plane is a picture you can see here in a second. That was a view as we were landing in Cambridge Bay. All you could see is ice and snow. And the odd building here or there off in the distance is what's known as the dew line, the uh, defense early warning system. And it was way up there north protecting, you know, Canada and all that from attacks coming across from the north. And it was very, very intricate system. And that's where it, it existed. And that was my view when I first got up to Cambridge Bay. That's what I saw. And then to get picked up at the airport. And the pastor of the church came out to pick me up at the airport to pick both Lynn and I up. And he was the pastor of Glad Tidings Church with Glad Tidings Arctic Missions. And he came and, you know, like, Jerry was just singing, it takes a little smile. Well, the smile on this man's face, Jerry, can you put the picture up? The smile on his face lights up the entire room. It, people in the community, when they see Pastor Harry coming, they see his smile, his entire face lights up. And that's what I walked into the airport to see. It was so wonderful. 
And I started to feel and realize then the warmth of the hearts of these people. These people were so warm hearted. It was amazing that the lady that actually founded this ministry up there, her name was Pastor Kay Gordon. She's in her, you know, getting up there in age now, but she's still very involved up in the Arctic in the mission up there. Her and Lynn Patterson were up there tirelessly. There's the church, Glad Tidings Church with Glad Tidings Arch Mission in Cambridge Bay. And that's Kay and Lynn in the corner. You can see them there. Kay was actually up there from the time she was in her late teens, early 20s, and gave her life to those people. But you know, just as much as she gave her life to them, they gave her life to their life to her. She they would do anything for Kay. When I walked around Cambridge Bay, as soon as they realized I was with Kay Gordon. It's like I had arms opened for whatever up in that area. They loved, they loved Pastor Kay, and they still do. Wonderful lady of God. But she wrote a book. If you're ever interested in books with mission stories, her book called God's Fire on Ice tells the story of her time heading up into the Arctic. And she would literally, as a young lady, very young lady, head out onto the what they called the reindeer deer trails when they were going out following the reindeer to catch them. And there she is, a young lady all alone up in the Arctic, sleeping in a tent at all these degrees below zero. I was up there, it's been anything, I've been up there from, you know, very low, below, my, very little below zero up to 83 one time was the worst it got when I was up there one time. But that time up in Cambridge Bay was averaging around 40-something below zero. But Kay slept in a tent in that weather. And she's been up there working amongst the Inuit for over 60 years. But I love her telling her stories with such passion of working with these people, these people with their arm, arms so wide open giving all that they can, all that they all that they have, all that they can give. And on some of the trips up there, it really did take getting used to. Because, you know, here we have our daytime and we have our nighttime. Times of the year up there, you've got 24 hours a day of daytime. You've got 24 hours a day of nighttime. This picture actually is 1120 in the morning. And that's as high as the sun got that day. And that's, that's actually just, it just sort of runs right along the horizon and goes right back down. Never got any higher than that at all. That was it. And that solid Arctic Ocean in front of it, the, the board, the shoreline and the ocean, frozen solid. Ice and snow was all that you could see. But it's amazing what happens when you're willing to put your heart into it. I fell in love with the people. Doing the meetings sometimes, it was cold. And there was this one set of meetings that we, we were doing, and I got up to speak. I couldn't figure out where this draft was coming from. But then I looked, and the door was wide open. And I called the pastor. I said, Pastor Harry, can we shut that door? And he looks at me. He said, no, we can't. I said, why? It's freezing in here. He says, yes, but there's a bunch of people outside. They can't fit in listening to the message, listening to the music, listening to the message, and they can't fit in. So we have to leave the door open so they can hear. And there were all these people out there with their warm parkas on and their scarves and their gloves and their babies in the hoods of their hat, of, the, of their jackets underneath the cover. And, and, you know, here in our comfort zone, if the air conditioning's not working, we don't want to go to church. If the if heater's not working, we won't step out to head that way. But up there, they're so hungry for the Word of God. They're so hungry for more of God that they'll stand out there in 40 below weather just to hear the message. Sometimes it's like they're almost running in circles and dancing just to keep a little bit warmer. But they're willing to do whatever it takes to receive more and more of God. But the lifestyle up there... To go into the grocery store, you would be absolutely shocked at some of the prices. I couldn't believe it. 
I know that when I got up there, the pastor had heard that, you know, if I want something to drink once in a while, my my, my drink of choice at that time was water or, or Diet Coke. I don't even like Diet Coke anymore, but that was my drink of choice at the time. <laughs> and he came home with these bags of groceries. And I looked at it. He'd bought bottled water for me, and he'd bought Diet Coke. And I looked at the bill. I could not believe the price because everything that comes up there has either got to be brought in on boat or flown in. Nothing can be driven up there for the stores. And so the expense is phenomenal. But I went, I remember one Christmas, I was up there just before Christmas, and I went and bought a little box, the half size box of mandarin oranges. I couldn't believe it when I got up to the till and the price of it. But that's what they have to live with daily, every single day. Buying, you know, fruits and vegetables, it's the only thing you can do. You can't, they don't grow up there. You can't grow, you don't have trees, you don't have gardens to grow things on. All you've got is this tundra, solid, frozen, Small, almost like a smog and frozen solid. And I couldn't believe it, looking at the prices. But then I realized why they spent so much time hunting their food and fishing. There was one trip that I was up there. I think Jerry was actually there with me that trip. And um, you go to have a meeting in, in the evening and hardly anybody is there. And I, we realized the pastor was telling us, no, they're all out fishing. The char, Arctic char, are running right now, and they're all fishing to get their supply for the winter. If they don't catch it now while well, it's running, they won't get it. So I've learned you don't go up there when the char are running, and you don't go up there this time of year because the mosquitoes are like the size of hummingbirds. <laughs> and you've got to sort of watch what time you, you head up there. But if the char are running, they're going to be very few people in the church. But then there's a picture here I want to show you of a, a man in his big parka and his friend. Well, actually, that one's a stuffed one, but that's a muskox, very typical to the Arctic. And for a while, that's the only place they were found was in the extreme Arctic. They're now known to be cut down into the Alaska area a bit, but further south, you don't find them. They're in the um, oxen family. It's called muskox. And uh, they, their fur is not used uh, as for clothing and things like that. It's very coarse, but their meat is absolutely delicious. I actually loved the muskox ribs. Their meat was very, very good. But that animal had a very specific characteristic that I found very interesting because the muskox, one day they took us out there. There was a herd of muskox just outside of Cambridge Bay, and they drove me out there to see it. And as soon as we started getting close, all of the adult muskox formed a circle all around their young. Their young were playing inside that circle, oblivious to what was going on around them. But the adults were keeping a very close eye on what we were doing. They were watching any approaching danger. They were watching anything that could possibly harm their young. You know, we need to have that characteristic in our life, that we have that same sense of protection. You know, the expression, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, up there in Cambridge Bay, that village was there to raise your child, helping your child. If they saw you, your child walking out in the street somewhere, they would make sure that they got home safely. They would make sure that that child was not in any danger. And that same the way the muskox took care of their young, protecting their young. It was amazing. But then they also had a very unusual mode of transportation that I got to try. This was one of the modes of transportation, a skidoo. <laughs> I wasn't very good at it. I would, I didn't get very fast at all, because except when I was sitting with somebody else and they were driving. But this thing, it gets you over all over the land. They go out in the land when they go hunting, towing a sled behind these, and it gets them over areas that a car would not go. They do have cars in Cambridge Bay, but they're mainly big trucks and things like that, but they're very little roads, so they don't go very far. They can only go a certain mile out of the town, number of miles out of the town, and then these things are your way of getting there, these skidoos. But it's really fun trying these different things. There was another thing, it was just like a, a 
sled, not the one I have the picture of here, but a sled, and you sit on it, and it is towed by dogs. And I sat on one, and I thought I would never, ever feel my behind again. It was like frozen solid. But here you have another picture of a sled being dr drawn by a dog. This is not one of your dog team's dogs. It's just one that goes around the town, towing people's groceries for them back from the grocery store to their homes. But it's another mode of transportation. You'd never see that down here in Vancouver. <laughs> It'd be real hard for it to drag a sleigh along the roads. But it's definitely a very interesting way of doing things. They also have unusual, un unusual ways of entertainment. This entertainment, <laughs> this is actually, it's called Many Pebbles. Municipal Golf Course, Cambridge Bay Municipal Golf Course. That is their golf course for you golf fanatics. But um, I was never quite sure how they'd know whether it was a rock or a golf ball that they were hitting. But somebody explained it to me that they had fluorescent golf balls and they had ways that they could tell them and you had to use these specific things. Otherwise, you could hit somebody in the head with a rock rather than just a golf ball. But the meetings that we had every night. People came out through the ice and cold. Ice and cold they came out to come for a meeting. There was still, sometimes the heat wasn't warm enough yet, and they're still there with their parkas on and their and their boots on. And you can see the lady in the front row there. She's got her mucklucks on. They make those by hand. They don't let any, when they catch an animal, they don't let it go to waste. They use the seal skin. They use things for the blubber a lot of the stuff for lighting and and heating and things like that but they don't let it go to waste they're not just hunting for the sake of hunting and killing these animals that's how they live that's how they feed themselves and but they would come out to the meetings at night and just anxiously await what god was going to do there was one night i will never forget the very end of the evening this man was waiting behind everybody else everybody else had gone and he came up to me and he said i need your help and the pastor was still around he was still working with some of the equipment and the guy said i need your help he said i have been dealing drugs up in the arctic for several years and i want to stop he said your message tonight impacted me so deeply i want to stop but i don't know what to do and so he said, let me go, I want to come back. And he came back, and all these drugs got disposed of very quickly. They were gone. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't just a little small package, it was bottles of drugs. And they went, but you know, after we got back down, to, down south, one of the people up there sent me a copy of a newspaper article. And it was talking about the drug shortage in the Arctic. Because this guy that had been one of the dealers had gotten rid of all the drugs, so they had a shortage up there. It was really interesting. Another guy with guns, same type of thing, same story went on. But the people were longing for more and more and more of God, just wanting to see God work. And all of those people, so hungry for a move of God. One of the people, he was like one of the elders of the church, Harry was what the pastor, but then there was another Harry, another pastor, Harry. He did a lot of the music. And I knew that he was struggling with some of the things that were going on and how, how he was going to carry on at this age with his, his work. And the Lord gave me a word for him that he was going to start writing, writing articles, and writing things that would have influence even in government places and in the communities. And the next trip I got up there, he started pulled out a little bold binder and he had copies of all these articles that he had written that were in post in newspapers right from the capital of Nunavut all the way through and all these articles that he had written. God gave him the word and he stood on it and it came to pass. So anyhow, can we go back to the picture with all of the people there again, Jerry, just to close before you as you go into your song. There we are. That's one side of the building. There's another side exactly the same. And the people just loved coming out to the meetings. 
When the, when the Arctic char weren't running, they loved coming out to the meetings. You get the Arctic char running and forget it, as I said. But these people, their smiles, their happy faces, the warmth in their hearts, you will never forget it. The warmth in their hearts, no matter how cold it is outside, what you feel is the warmth in their hearts. And Jerry has one more song he's going to do as we're coming to a close. And it's called The Prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make of me an instrument of your peace. hatred let me so love where there is doubt let me so faith where there is injury let me so pardon where there's discord please let me so unity where there is error let me sow the truth where there's despair Oh, let me sow hope where there is sadness Let me sow joy where there is darkness Please let me sow the light That I may not seek to be consoled But rather to console, not to be understood But rather to understand, not to be loved But rather to love, for it is in giving that we will receive and in forsaking That we truly gain by forgiving That we are forgiven and in dying That we are born again to eternal life
Lord, make of me an instrument of your peace. You know, when I was telling you way back at the beginning about the impression that I had on the airplane, that I was telling the pastor that was with me, Lynn, and I didn't, I didn't understand why God was showing me that at that point. But once we got up there in the meetings, I understood. There was someone up in the village. It's actually a hamlet. It was so small. My population at the beginning was about 800 and something. Now it's about 1,700. But it was so small. And this woman had lost her son up in that area. And she was really worried that he was suffering or had been, been hurt when actually the Lord very clearly said, he went in peace. He went in peace. He wasn't in pain. And it made all the difference to her life and being able to move forward. It's amazing what God can do when we let him. Absolutely amazing. A man, a drug trafficker that wants to turn his life around, he received the Lord that night. But, you know, I realized that, as in many other places, but in, in up there, I went up there to give, but I also knew that I was going to receive. And I learned so much in these different trips. I learned not only cultures, issues, but I also learned a lot of ways of love and people hungering for more of God, wanting more, no matter what it takes to get it. I couldn't imagine myself standing outside in 40 degree, 43 degrees, it was actually that day, 43 degrees below zero to hear a message. And yet that's how hungry they are. And I would question myself, do I have that kind of hunger? Am I willing to do whatever it takes? And going to some of these places, I've learned that I've got so much more to learn. Anyways, let me pray before you go. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all of these experiences that we can learn from, Father. Lord, I don't know why you showed me that image at first. I had no idea, but I knew it was going to be important. I had no idea what was going to happen to the Arctic when that guy got rid of his drugs. No idea. But God, you did. Lord, the influence that Harry would have with his writing throughout the Arctic. Amazing what you could do, Lord. But Father, I ask that right now you will speak to the hearts of those desiring more, longing for more, and show them right where they're at how you desire to speak to them and use them exactly where they're at and wherever you choose to take them. But Father, have your perfect will today as we go seeking more of you in every moment of our life. In Jesus' precious name I ask. Praise God. I hope that these meetings have been blessing you. This was actually number nine of this series. Number nine. If you would like to get the full list, I keep putting it up every once in a while on my Facebook page and on Beyond Compare Ministries' Facebook page as to how you can get the list of all of these replays and can catch any that you've missed. But if you're being blessed by these meetings and you'd like to in some way help out this ministry, support this ministry, Jerry's going to put a link up on the, on the, pla on the um, screen so you know where you could send a donation to. And it goes to extending more and more what God's doing. So God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Love you guys. Hopefully we'll see you next week. The e-transfer method is only works for it in Canada. PayPal works all over. So hopefully we'll see you next week. God bless you.